Hello, and welcome to Season 4 of the LuxCast, where we explore the intersections of Christian faith, culture, and our lives. My name is Megan Rice, LuxCast Director and Communications Coordinator at Western Theological Seminary. Today's guest is Dr. Jonathan Pennington, Associate Professor of New Testament Interpretation at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and author of The Sermon on the Mount and Human Flourishing, a Theological Commentary. WTS alum Emily Houlihan sat down with Dr. Pennington to discuss civility in a divisive cultural moment and how Jesus and the Beatitudes provide a roadmap for human flourishing. Welcome, Jonathan. Thanks. Thank you so much for being here today. This season we're looking at civility and we just, we'd love to hear your reflections and thoughts on that. Sure. So right now we are living in a divided world. Um, it's a complicated cultural moment and not only that, but the church itself is also divided. How, how do you navigate this as an individual, as a, as a professor, as a pastor, as a spouse, as a father? How do you participate and yeah. navigate that? Yeah, well, the, uh, I think social media is obviously a big part of mm -hmm. it. And Definitely. for me, just personally, I make very, I very carefully think about anything I ever post and I basically don't post anything political or incendiary mm -hmm. in any ways. I try to yeah. keep it fun and interesting and things I'm reading and thinking about. So that for me is like a, just a personal conviction to, to not engage in any way in that way. Um, I think also, though for me, I, I think a lot about uh, the idea of that scripts are running for us, this kind of idea from cognitive linguistics, if you've mm -hmm. run across that, the idea that whenever anyone hears something, what's happening is, is that it, it actually activates scripts in our minds, so whole stories and narratives. And, and so when I think about interacting with people, I try to really think about the fact that anything I say, anything they're saying is actually coming from a narrative that's motivating a lot of what they're doing. And so I really try to be aware of trying to understand what mm -hmm. other people's scripts are so that anything I say or anything they say is actually coming from that narrative. So that's one thing I really try to do is I just think about trying not to engage just what's being said, but trying to engage the narrative that's underneath it is something I've tried to do. I'm sure not yeah. always successfully, so. Definitely. Um, in that, how has your engagement with the Gospel of Matthew, mm -hmm. and in particular the Sermon on the Mount, which is your most recent book, um, mm -hmm. a commentary, mm -hmm. the Sermon on the Mount and um, Human Flourishing, right. how has your engagement with these things um, influenced that um, just that conversation, of, yeah, right. how's that shaped, shaped you yeah, in yeah. particular? Especially civility and these yeah. issues, yeah. Um, I think, uh, as I've continued to say Matthew, one of the things that has really struck me is that the idea of mercy, um, mm -hmm. which looks like forgiving other people, uh, is I'd say probably the primary ethical argument that Matthew is wanting to make for us uh, through Jesus' teaching, is that Jesus is, is promoting that to be righteous is really to be a merciful person. And it's you can see that in teachings all throughout, but one of the most fascinating ways is right at the very beginning of Matthew, the first character we meet and the first person who's described as righteous, really the only person who's really described as righteous is Joseph, the husband yeah. of Mary. Mm -hmm. And it says explicitly that he is righteous and because of that, he decides to put Mary away secretly rather than shamefully because mm -hmm. it turns out she's pregnant and they're mm -hmm. not married yet, right? So it's yeah. a major, scandal. I mean, it's a scandal yeah. then, it'd be even more, I mean, scandal now even more then. Yeah. And it's interesting that Matthew depicts him as being a righteous person precisely because rather than doing the what we would say the just thing is to have her shamed publicly, and this is before right. the angel appears to right. Joseph right. and tells him that, he's righteous because he decides out of mercy and compassion to let her be put away quietly so that no shame comes to her. Mm. And then, I mean, you wouldn't maybe get all of what I'm saying from just that uh, first reading of that story, but as you trace that theme throughout Matthew, you see that he's constantly, Jesus is constantly teaching that to be righteous is to be merciful toward others, to forgive others, as hard as that mm. is. And so, as I think about civility and as I think about living in society, um, according to Jesus, this kind of righteousness has got to start there. It's got to start with uh, seeking to understand others and seeking to forgive others, mm. whatever happens personally or, or societally as well. So that's one yeah. way that Matthew is much on my mind when I think about yeah. relating to others in society. So. so in your most recent book, The Sermon on the Mount and Human Flourishing, you put forward this argument on mm -hmm. page 14. 
You say the sermon is Christianity's answer to the greatest metaphysical question that hum humanity has always faced. How can we experience true human flourishing? What is happiness, blessedness, shalom, and how does one obtain and sustain it? Those are big questions. Right. <laughs> um, so do you think that today's climate of division is distracting us mm. from this vision of God, from God's vision of human flourishing and shalom mm. and blessedness? Mm -hmm. And if so, how? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I, it feels like, and this is not just in our time period, I mean, we always have to realize that everybody is, thinks that this is the worst of days, right, you know, in right. that sense. But, but I, I do think we're in an, a season where it seems like there's a lot of desperate defensiveness, that everyone is really desperately trying to defend their way of understanding the world and their way of being in the world. And for me, one of the things that the whole years of studying and coming to this kind of vision that the Bible is about human flourishing, the Bible's about um, restoring humanity to, the, to our fullness, mm -hmm. is that, that that's a constructive work rather than a defensive work. And mm -hmm. so what I think I'm learning from the Bible and trying to be myself is to approach every situation saying, how can I build beautiful things? And what, and what motivates me in the classroom? Um, I'm also an administrator at my school and run our PhD program. And so okay. one of the things my staff always know that we have all these you know, kind of fun acronyms, and one of them is BWB, which is build with beauty. Like everything mm. we do from yeah. the smallest event to policies we make, we're trying to say, how can we build beautiful and excellent things that will be life-giving to people? And, mm -hmm. and then that looks like a million different things. But for me, that comes from and is fed by this idea that the Bible really, and God himself, is about restoring us to fullness of humanity. And I think if we can begin to talk that way, have that be a grammar of how we talk to each other, rather than primarily the metaphor that we often use in Christianity, which is we need to defend the truth or we need to defend a certain mm -hmm. way. And there is a time to defend the truth. And I'm not saying everything just nothing matters or right. something like that. But we have to really pay attention to the metaphors that we use to describe our own stories. Mm -hmm. And when our metaphors are all defensive and warlike, I think that affects us in yeah. ways that, um, whether you're Christians or not, and this applies on both sides, doesn't help civility, doesn't help mm -hmm. building, where I would suggest we replace some of our warlike metaphors. Occasionally we need those, but replace them with more constructive ones. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, talking about building and beauty and glory and excellence and flourishing, or a, a new word I've been learning, I got from one of my students that I'd heard but didn't really know what it meant, auspiciousness, which mm. is kind of a weird word, but it means basically something like flourishing as well. So for me, mm -hmm. thinking again about, as I said at the beginning, something about the scripts that run for us, part right. of that idea of scripts is thinking about what metaphors we use to describe ourselves and when, if we can shift, you yeah. know, towards more positive constructive metaphors, I think that would help society as well. And those positive metaphors are found within the Bible. Absolutely, um, yeah. And in the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, and absolutely. And the Beatitudes. Yeah, the vision. So you're not pulling them from nowhere. Yes, that's right, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, so speaking about Beatitudes, mm -hmm. uh, when reading your book, I was particularly drawn into that section, and especially the translation that you offer. Um, I often read, blessed be or blessed mm -hmm. are the, and instead you use the word flourishing. Mm -hmm. Um, can you tell us a bit about why you translate the Greek word in that way and how it affects our reading of the Beatitudes yeah, today? Yeah, good question. There, I've had the opportunity to talk about this a lot because it is, well, it's a, it's a big debate uh, mm -hmm. within, how to, within translation studies as well as commentaries on Matthew. How do you translate this word? And the two options in English are mostly blessed, which is what you probably see most commonly, or less frequently, happy. Yeah. And happy doesn't really work because happy in English today is such a kind of a shallow word for a temporary emotional state. Right. Um, you'll find in earlier English, though, happy meant something closer to, I think, what this Greek word makarios means. And the idea is basically that uh, makarios is a description of what a state of being is that is true happiness or true shalom, if you want to use the Hebrew mm -hmm. idea, or true flourishing. Um, and this is something that people in the ancient world talked a lot about. They, they asked, what is the state of makariasness? The gods are makar. They are the ultimate ones who are 
complete, whole, satisfied? Mm -hmm. How can humanity enter into the same kind of state is the question that the Greek philosophers and Roman philosophers and I think the Bi Hebrew Bible and the New Testament is asking too. And for me, a, a big part of the journey of this book and reading the sermon was coming to recognize that, oh, Jesus isn't just pronouncing divine blessings. Like, if you do this, you'll be blessed, or kind of like Deuteronomy, if you do this, you'll live, versus mm -hmm. if you do this, you'll be cursed. It's actually more of an invitation to us, an appeal to say, don't you want fullness of life? Then here are the ways of being in the world that correspond to fullness of life. And that's what I think the Beatitudes are. They are a vision, an invitation to ways of being, not that somehow earn God's favor or something, but ways of being to, to inhabit ourselves that will result in what we long for. And I think it's the same way as Psalm 1, which uses mm -hmm. the same, same root word in Hebrew and in right. Greek, which is the idea of here's a way of being, meditating on God's word, living in his ways, not giving yourselves to ways of wickedness. And what will the result be? A tree that flourishes mm -hmm. versus chaff that's blown away. And I think that's the kind of wisdom appeal context that the, the Beatitudes are giving us, and that's why I've chosen to translate it flourishing, yeah. even though I know it's not a perfect translation. Yeah. And it seems kind of weird in English, but I think that's what I'm trying to get at with that uh, translation. Right, so they're not if-then statements. It's more casting a vision for yeah, what that's flourishing right. yeah, that's, can be. Yeah, that's, um, as you may have seen in the book, and some reviews have pointed out, I mean, th this is the real trick with translating the Beatitudes, is what is the relationship between the first part and the second part? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we say, in this kind of weird way, if you do this, then you'll be blessed, but then that second part doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven or something. And what I'm suggesting is that actually the relationship of those two parts is a statement of true human flourishing that is crazy, <laughs> right? Poor in spirit, hungry and thirsting, um, you know, giving up your rights, being meek and humble, those are not what we think is flourishing. And then the reason why Jesus isn't crazy is in the second part, because he actually says that there's gonna be this great reversal and things are not as you think they are. So flourishing of the poor in spirit, because theirs is actually the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Um, so our last question, how does this particular reading of the Beatitudes and, and the Sermon on the Mount itself influence the way we interact with the world um, and with each other, especially in this civil dialogue. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I think I would say it's more of what I was trying to get at before is that I think Jesus invites us into what we really want. We really want to find true happiness mm -hmm. and the way he says to find it is not what our natural inclination is, which is to make sure we're always standing up for our rights and make sure right. that we always get justice and make sure that um, this happens and this is preserved, et cetera. I mean, some of those things are important. I'm not anti-justice or something. But the point is, he's inviting us to pay attention to our inside, our hearts, and to, again, habituate ourselves toward his coming kingdom. And that habituation looks like Jesus himself. I mean, one of the most important insights about the Beatitudes is that Jesus is the ultimate model of all of them. He's poor in spirit. He hungers and thirsts for righteousness. He's pure in heart. He's humble. He's a peacemaker. Right? Mm -hmm. He is merciful towards others. All the Beatitudes, Jesus is that. Mm -hmm. And so to be a Christian in society is to be a follower of Jesus mm -hmm. in that same way, to follow the way of being in the world that he himself is the ultimate model. And I think when we do that, that's going to promote civility. That's going to promote being constructive and building and serving and being beautiful rather than, again, defensiveness and, and uh, just a uh, a soul focus on preservation of our own rights or something like that. So. Right. so it points to the flourishing of not just ourselves, but of all of humanity. Including. Yeah, that's right. And I just say the last thing I'd say then, I guess, is just one of the things that influenced me the most as I was writing this book over mm -hmm. years was um, Walter Storff's idea that the Bible is not just about my individual shalom or human flourishing, yeah. it's about God's work in the world to spread shalom throughout the world, the shaloming, he doesn't mm -hmm. call it that, he calls it the aaronization, which is quite a mouthful, I think, but <laughs> yeah. the, the peaceifying or the shaloming mm -hmm. of the world is what God is about and therefore we should be about as well. Well, great. Well, thank you so thank much, you. Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being with us today and That's for sharing pleasure. your thoughts. Thanks a lot for having me.